Hello again to a, no, uh, to a new talk in the Cloud Native Rejects EU 2024. Uh, please welcome Anais and Michael on uh, massive data losses. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining and staying at the conference. Uh, so this talk is the bang when bad things happen to your data. Just a quick disclaimer, all personas and entities referenced in this presentation are entirely fictional, unless we state it otherwise. However, the security events described are based on real-world events, occurrences. Uh, we just modified a few parts to them. Now, my name is Anais Rolis. I'm developer advocate at Aqua Security within their open source engineering team. I contribute to their open source projects, Trivi and Tracy and also Kate's GBT, which is within the CNCF. I also have a personal newsletter, and I publish tutorials on my own YouTube channel. Yeah, hey everyone, so I'm Michael Cade. I'm a technologist at Veeam Software, where we only talk about bad things around your data. Uh, also from an open source perspective, so projects like Canister that's just been donated to the CNCF as a sandbox project. I'm also the author of 90 Days of DevOps, which hopefully many of you are aware of. Um, yeah, let's get into the fun stuff. Awesome. So here's, in short, what we're going to talk about, what this presentation is all about. When you develop your application, you build new features, you're deploying your application stack, and then you're managing it, at some point, you will encounter the bad stuff. At some point, you will encounter the bang, as we reference in this presentation. So there's a lot that you can do beforehand to prepare for that bang uh, and to be more ready as an organization within your runbooks, within your processes, and also the application stack that you've set up. Uh, we heard a lot about open telemetry and how that can help you identify when, th when things actually do go wrong in your application. But then also once the bang has happened, what do you do afterwards for the remediation? So both of these aspects are tightly interlinked. Um, what do you do before? to prevent it, but then what do you do afterwards to recover from it as quickly as possible and without uh, <laughs> too many people realizing? <laughs> so we introduced to you Rejects Game Development. That's me. I'm from Rejects Game Development. I invite you all to check out our, one of our latest games, um, Pac-Man. You can go here to the link and play uh, if you have your phone in your hand. Um, <laughs> and this game is actually it's based on uh, the GitHub repository that you can see here. So just a quick shout out to the original developers that this game uh, that we provide today is based on. So I'm the software supplier in this scenario. And I'm working on the software supply chain um, and everything that goes in. So basically anything that's involved in me developing Pac-Man is part of my software supply chain, is part of me making sure that uh, everything runs smoothly, that we can uh, develop and deploy update features and release features to our clients uh, in a quickly and accessible manner. Uh, that involves developing the code, the ACD pipelines we have, as well as the testing that we implement. So this is our quick overview of our stack. We have a MongoDB backend and a Node.js frontend, all running on Kubernetes. And we call this Pac-Man as a service. Now, our technical solution from a security perspective involves, involves four main components. One of them is security scanning, uh, compliance checks. So we are checking our, we are, our code base and our configuration files, uh, whether they are compliant with certain benchmarks within the industry that define best practices. Then we also have set up our own policies to enforce uh, specific rules that we want to have as an organization. And we implement continuous monitoring of our application stack on your own clusters as we develop our application. So here are some of the solutions that we integrate with. Uh, we're using Trivi, an open source all-in-one security scanner for scanning on the local development machines, but also on our CICD pipelines. C for compliance checks, we're using CAS benchmarks. And then for policy enforcement, we're using Rego from OPA, uh, which is with in the CNCF, and there's an alternative that you could use on your Kubernetes cluster as well, in addition, called Kiviano. And then we also have, as part of continuous monitoring at runtime versus static scanning that you can do continuously of your deployed resources. 
Now, in addition to that, we also take great care in actually um, training our new employees. So everybody goes through a comprehensive program uh, to know about all of our security standards. And then we also have a very comprehensive uh, policy handbook that we hand out to everybody to study. Now, in terms of the distribution, uh, this is how it looks. Uh, we basically provide uh, Conference Games, which is one of our clients, one of the vendors, um, with Pac-Man in this case. Uh, and this is a Helm chart that we uh, release, and they then deploy and run for their conference games. Now, in addition to that, as a supplier of my software, I can do several other things from a security perspective to provide the, the clients, the vendors, with further reassurance of what vulnerabilities might be present in the codes in the software that I supply, um, and also what steps they can take in case there are security issues. So VEX is, is fairly new in the space and basically details that if there is a, a vulnerability in the software that I provide, then I can release a VEX document and detail how does it actually, how does the vulnerability actually affect that, that software that I release. Um, now this talk is not going to go into more detail, but I'm sure throughout KubeCon there are lots of Lots of other amazing talks related to the topic. And then I can also release SBOMs, software bill of materials that detail all of the dependencies, everything that's part of my application that I release. So even though uh, my clients only get the, the release that they actually deploy and run, I can also provide them with an inventory list of everything that's within uh, that release. And before we move on, I'm just also going to give a quick demo of everything that I have part uh, of my software supply chain to, uh, here's the game. More. More? Okay. Um, cool. Um, so, first of all, all of the, everybody who is part of uh, Reject's game development is required as part of our runbooks to also do local uh, security scanning before they actually push changes to Git. So, we encourage everybody to do file system scanning uh, with Trivi, and that will show people developers, the engineers, uh, first of all, if there are any new vulnerabilities that they have added to the code base, but also if there are any exposed secrets, for example, if they included anything as part of their testing. Oh, you yeah, can't just, see it. Just go down a couple. Okay. Can you see it? If you, run, do it if again? you run that same command again. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so Trivi file system, just scans the local file system. Now, this being a Node.js project, this is pretty impressive that there are no vulnerabilities detected, <laughs> um, uh, which is what we want, right? So this is our standard, zero vulnerabilities. Now, something else we can do, um, we have actually, as part of our security policies, we have developed a regular policy that basically specifies what uh, container images are allowed to be part of our uh, Docker file, for example, as part of the base image. So we verify that only the base images that we have approved uh, are actually part of then the, the Docker file, uh, in the Docker file, and are then actually uh, part of the release. Um, because everything that I include in the Docker file in the different layers will ultimately end up in the final, in the final version that's going to run on the different machines. Now, I can run, uh, I can check this policy um, against my Docker file in this case, just as an example of one of the policies that we implement. And that's also done with the Trivi file system command. It's just a bit longer command. <laughs> and basically here we pass in, uh, we say that we want to have a misconfiguration scanner. So we want to scan all of, uh, in this case, our Docker file for any resources that are anything that's misconfigured. It's not, not configured as part of best practices within the space or as part of our policy, and we pass in here the policy um, to, to scan that Docker file. Now, in this case, we have here our own um, policy that we defined. Uh, so we can't use the node latest image. We have to use the current image for node, um, for the node-based image. And then also, in the same time, um, we the best practice in the industry tells us basically that we should define a tag um, as part of our uh, base image. So we can do that instead. 
Um, so this is just one of the scanning we do. Then also as part of our CICD pipeline, we do continuous scanning of our container images of the base image before we actually build the container image. And then further down, we also implement security uh, vulnerability scanning of our built container image. And then we generate as well an SBOM of every uh, new container image that we built. Now, as part of the file system scanning, uh, that's also something we do uh, every time we merge new changes into our main branch. Um, in this case, our main branch is called rejects. Uh, and then we also upload the vulnerabilities, if there are any found, into the GitHub uh, security tab. Now, lastly, before we release any new software, we also scan the Helm chart that's ultimately released to our clients for vulnerabilities. So these are the different steps that we take from a supply chain perspective. Awesome. So that was very much the prevention. How does a software company deliver a more tighter security model when it comes to releasing their software? Now, I'm the, I'm the, the, the user, the buyer of the software, so I'm using the Helm chart that is deployed out of the back of that software that enables me to run my conference games, Pac-Man as a service out there. You could argue that it could be called YOLO games instead of conference because I'm just using the defaults and that's what we're going to get into is that it's very easy to get a default application up and running from a Helm chart without really looking at all the Helm chart values and it's really just a, about raising awareness of what uh, the, the defaults aren't probably the most secure. In fact, I would argue that they're definitely not the most secure in most instances. So hopefully with that rejects uh, up the stack .io, hopefully some of you have added some critical information to our, oh, there's some giant swarm <laughs> guys in the room. Good stuff. So, and, and feel free to, to play on my newly created Pac-Man as a service, PAS. Um, but ideally what we, want to, what we want to show here is, so I've spun up an EKS cluster using Terraform. I'm gonna to touch on that, what that means from our side as well as a, as a software um, or as, a, as a, a gaming engine which is quite fitting given the, the, the location that we're in. Um, and with that, we're gonna start picking away some of the vulnerabilities. And the reason why I'm stood down here in the heat of the lights with a hoodie on is because I'm gonna flip into a different persona and we're gonna cause some problems and cause that bang that we spoke about. So hopefully, okay, some more giant swarm guys, awesome. <laughs> Clearly you've been spending a lot of time and not listening to an A's, bad, <laughs> bad of you, bad of you there. Um, so before we, before we kick off, so one of the things that we've got is obviously Pac-Man is exposed, that Node.js front end is there, that's what we're serving out to the internet. But if we take a look into the, into the terminal, if we clear this but jump down and we do a kubectl get service and we look at the two services, please don't copy this because that will ruin the demo. Um, the external IP that you see here, one is the Pac-Man, so the Node.js front end but the Helm chart that we're deploying actually exposes this service, which is our MongoDB backend. So what that means is that, and when I look at the Terraform, you'll see some more mistakes that have been made in, in YOLO games. And if we look, I've got uh, sorry, MongoDB compass connected to that. Yes, I have authentication into that, but ultimately we don't really want to exp be exposing our mission critical data, them being the scores. Out to, out to the public, um, just internal to the, to the Kubernetes cluster. So what we first want to do, now that we've got some high scores and mission critical, what I want to make sure is, as part of that right of bang, that remediation, we want to make sure that we're secure and protected if bad things happen. And let me give you the spoiler, is that bad things are going to happen, so we better take a backup. Now, normally you would integrate this into your, like your CD pipeline to be able to run this on a bespoke um, schedule. I'm doing this here because I want to prove that I'm taking a fresh, fresh backup of our, of our application. So let's just run that, and then what we'll do while that's running is let's jump back into our terminal. Okay, we're going to have to do some diving around. So let's go here, let's go into, because I literally just went onto the Terraform site and downloaded the Learn Terraform Provision EKS cluster. And obviously with that, there might, there might be something bad in there that, that causes us. So I'm going to run trivia again against my IAC. 
Um, again, an open source project that everyone should be using or at least having some insight into this. And you can start to see network rules on my EKS cluster are pretty open. The whole seeder is open, zero, 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 bad practice. But again, Terraform, it's not really Terraform's fault, it's for their learning modules. So, but again, this is how I built my EKS cluster, YOLO games, right? Um, hopefully by now we should have a backup. And so under the, under the hood with this backup, so I'm using Casting K10, um, and we're leveraging Canister. Canister is a, an open source application framework that allows us to dive into the data service, the database in this instance being MongoDB. It allows us to run a pre and post hook so that we're pausing IO and stopping that transactional um, so that we're taking a good, clean, consistent backup. And we're sending that off to S3, an S3 bucket, which is an immutable bucket um, for that. But if I just show you what that blueprint looks like, and we can use Canister as a standalone tool, but there's no scheduler, there's no orchestration. What K10 allows me to do is orchestrate everything in one place against multiple different data services. And we can even use things like PG Dump when it comes to Postgres as well to orchestrate that. But ultimately, what we're doing with this blueprint, it's really saying, this is what I want to do at whatever point. So if it's a, uh, a pre-hook, this is us telling we're going to take a backup, pause I.O., and then we're going to release that after the backup is complete. Now, hopefully, our backup is complete. We'll get in there. So as that, so the snapshot is, is completed. We were actually just up, upstairs at another session where it was talking about CSI and backups. And actually, the first thing, first question was around snapshots not being backups. And I fully endorse that. It's not. But snapshots are a very good way in which we can recover very quickly versus having to go off to our S3 bucket to pull back that data. So I want to leverage both of those, especially EBS snapshots that are quite durable. I want to be able to use that. So what we're doing is we're sending our backups of our, of our mission critical high scores with the, uh, the, the giant swarm guys. Um, and you can see in here that we're using a, another open source project called Copia to basically lift and shift that data in a consistent fashion off to object storage. So you can see we've got our Pac-Man backup in a load of blocks that a uh, load of blobs into our into our storage. Okay, let's. Uh, I don't know if I can put this hood over my head and cause a. <laughs> and notice now that I've transitioned into a, a bad person. Remember that I've got my my service exposed, um, and then let's just say, for example, we've uh, we've lost. Um, well, we've given away access. Access can be bought online, and I'll, I'll touch through this and recap on the slides as we, as we go through as well. So if we jump into VS Code, oh, in fact, no, terminal. I don't want you to see any of these credentials. Um, so CD is really hot in here. Um, <laughs> and an appropriate hacker directory. So I have, I have two. I have two scripts that I'm going to run. One is a bucket attack, so I've been able to get hold of my S3 credentials. I can buy them online. If you go on the dark web, you can pay for anything from $500 up to $10,000, depending on your target. Not, don't ask me how I know all of this. Um, and then the other is that DB attack. So that service being exposed means that, well, really anyone can get it, because obviously my secret is just stored in a Kubernetes secret, base64 in decrypt. Job done. I can get into that. So. Let's, um, let's do the DB first. OK, so we're connecting to that MongoDB. We've found your database. We've connected to it. The rejects is the, is the name of the hacker group that I'm part of. The mission critical data has been compromised and encrypted. And if any one of the giant swarm guys are still on there, if you go and look at your high scores, and I'll do it with you. Oh. oh. So the top one now, so Giant Swarm haven't won anything today. Um, everything's been encrypted. The, the reject uh, hacker group have now have control of this data, or do they? Um, so really, the, the key part there is obviously the database has been compromised. Actually, when I ra I've run a couple of honeypots around MongoDB being exposed to the internet, and it's amazing how fast. I was actually really nervous coming into the demo that we actually might have been attacked for real. Um, and I'll show that. I'll show a live example of that in the in the slides as we as we get into it. 
Did I say it was hot in here? <laughs> um, OK, so let's then run our bucket attack. So I showed you, I showed you our, our existing bucket. So it's going to connect to our S3 bucket. We found the bucket's called, bucket called Rejects Immutable, and we're attacking that bucket. Oh, no. Oh, I don't really want to show you the, uh, the M for that. <laughs> Or do I? In fact, I could put it to the top line, then you won't see it. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 they have to, wait, 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 they have the screen there. So you would have to unplug it. I'm just unplugging. <laughs> you see? Don't worry about that. It'll be gone before you've even copied it. Don't worry, YouTube. This won't, this won't matter afterwards. Anyway, I've got to be quick. Right. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter because we've got a backup and it's immutable, so it's fine. I've, so I've just encrypted it again. That's a bad thing. Uh, and then let's do the bucket attack. Love a demo. Love a live demo. Um, OK, so the objects are deleted. If we go and check that in our bucket, which has probably kicked me out already. <laughs> OK, bad times. We don't have any backups, but we're sending our backups to an immutable. I can finally take this off now. We've been paged. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Bad things are happening. Happening. People want to get on Pac-Man. Luckily, we have show versions, immutability. We have object lock enabled. Good stuff. So we've got our backups. OK, so let's start that restore while I then jump into the, some of the slides. So if I go to application. Again, this is going to use that MongoDB blueprint to bring back that, that application in a consistent state. Let's make sure we choose the right one. And before anyone actually gains access to my cluster, uh, let's restore that. Now, because of time, I'm restoring everything back as it was. So this is going to actually restore the whole application. I can be granular from a K10 point of view. I can bring back just that PVC with that database. or I can bring back certain individual items. I can also transform what that, that application looks like. So one idea would be is let's not expose that database anymore via a service. Um, if I do a clear and a watch, we should start to see one, we're bringing down the whole application, and then we're bringing up the good, the good copy, the, the one before anything bad was to happen. Just so that you're, you see that. OK, so and now what we're doing is we're, we're going to bring that back from S3 into our EKS cluster and restore that. Then in, in an ideal world, that service, we should actually fix that in our, in our, um, our re repo so that we're not deploying that software again as a, as a or that service again as a, uh, a, a, in an exposed fashion. So fingers crossed, as long as anyone hasn't used those keys to get in. Um, and to be fair, if anyone has on their phone, that, fair play, that's, that's very quick. <laughs> now I'm nervous. If we go to the dashboard, we can start to see. OK, so something is restoring. That's good. So what we'll see here is that what, what Anais talked about was we're going to see that Node.js front end, and we're going to see that Mongo database pod come back up. And then everything else will start getting it back into that desired state. And hopefully, the giant swarm guys are going to be back on top. OK, good. Phew. No one's, uh, no one's deleted the cluster just yet. Um, again, YOLO gaming. <laughs> So fingers crossed, and I'm sure the giant swarm guys are refreshing that web page <laughs> just to see if they're back in. OK, the moment of truth. We go back here and we look at our high scores. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh. OK, that looks good. That, that's a success. <laughs> But we should never really get to this point, right? So ideally, you want, to, you want to lock down that service. You don't want anyone to gain access to that. So whilst I jump back to the slides and think about how people are using my uh, AWS credentials that only have access to that bucket, but still. Um, so one of the things, what can bad look like? You saw, so from an access perspective, from a database perspective, from services, just from default configuration. I don't really know anything about Kubernetes, and I just went and did Helm, 
Helm repo add and, and then Helm repo is, or Helm install. And I now have Pac-Man and I started selling that to, to you guys to go and play with, with that game. What I also made sure though that I do have a, a backup of that. So from an access point of view, what does that look like? So ransomware is pretty hard, right? If you're gonna concentrate your life career on exploiting and ex extorting companies and, and getting that money from them from a ransomware perspective, then you're gonna have to find some sort of entry point. You're gonna have to compromise some sort of user account or, or authentication within that business. You're gonna find some misconfigurations and then you're gonna find some way of being able to get into that environment to cause damage. Or you could just go and buy it on the dark web like I mentioned. And really, you could go from anything from $300 that will give you an SSH into a, a random company or you can pay a bit more of a targeted approach and pay up to 10,000, and I'm sure there's much more than that as well. You can target by industry. It's basically a shopping cart to find access to a business, because we all know there's vulnerabilities out there that, we can, that can be exploited. I'm going back really to the end of 2022 when we started to see what, what ransomware, what cyber attacks look like from a Kubernetes point of view. So Hildegard was a, a malware attack on Kubernetes, which would not necessarily extort data and ask for a ransom, but they would take over that compute and they would start scaling up that, that cluster and they would start to leverage that to mine cryptocurrency on your Kubernetes clusters. Um, so it's been around for a while. This is a live picture of my uh, honeypot that was an unsecured Mongo database. It was actually Pac-Man again in that, uh, that demo. It was publicly accessible, misconfigured, encryption. Again, it was the default. Defaults aren't always good. We all have backups, don't we? And that's a question. But equally, so we've, we've done the bad thing around like the hoodie up, the, the hacker, the, the cyber threats. But equally, we all make mistakes. We make accidental deletions and corruptions to our database, our data services. And generally, that's the mission critical. Over lunch, I was talking to a few people about um, how many people have dropped a database in production. Yeah, I imagine quite a few of us have, have done such a thing. But it's not all bad. Because we've obviously got, and a lot of the talks today have been the doom and gloom of bad things happening, which is great that we're raising awareness of it, but we have to consider what that, how do we fix that? And we have a whole, to, to coin Engin's vending machine, we have a whole vending machine of security products and projects that we can take advantage of, but we have to think about what that access looks like, what that control looks like, but equally, what does backup, what does bad look like for you and your application out there? And then think about that offsite backup location, that immutable um, that immutable location, an A's. I'm still conscious about my AWS key. <laughs> oh, you need your laptop. <laughs> uh -huh. um, yeah, so this was just a demonstration of things that could happen, as well as, for example, me as the vendor providing insecure default configuration, providing the services as load balancers, and not thinking about them actually just taking the default configuration and going ahead and deploying it. Now, here are some of the resources that we've used, so you can check those out. Um, different resources as well as the, the main uh, application. And then this one is just a set of lots of different, like a long list of how different misconfigurations led to entire databases and millions of records being exposed by hundreds of companies, which is super interesting. So 2021 data. And I have a KubeCon talk on Friday, actually jumping in for a coworker if you want to learn more about S-bombs and how you can leverage Harbor to manage your S-bombs. Thank you. Now I need to get onto the console. <laughs> you have any questions? Thank you both. We're running a bit late, but we were encountering technical difficulties before we started. Um, so I'll say there's room for two questions. Any questions? How? No, that's just that's a ghost. That's a ghost image. That's not what's on the screen. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, are there any questions? Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a second, no worries. As soon as I've deleted it. <laughs> yes, I know you need to change it. All right. We'll have a number of uh, five minute talks after What's this. That? Oh, there's one question. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if it was streamed. It was? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, no one accessed it. Thank you. That was my TED talk. 
Hey guys, thank, <laughs> thanks for the talk. Uh, I just have one question regarding your MongoDB honeypot. Um, how long did it actually take until it got accessed and what did these guys do with it and what did you do afterwards? So it was really about, so it was for a demo similar to this. Um, it was eight minutes. So where there's a port scanner around the particular MongoDB port, it's 27,000 something, I think. Um, there was obviously something happening at that point that picked it up and yeah, that's when they, they encrypted all the data in there. Now, luckily, working for a backup company, I had a regular cadence of backups that were happening, so I could restore it just in time to go on stage and do the talk. But yeah, it was a, a fun little little project. So I actually, like, I, so there was a ransomware message in there and a Bitcoin address, but I, did, like, I didn't hang around too long. I went and closed the service off. I went back, I restored it, and then went and did the session. So I didn't really dive into it as as uh, as you would normally from a honeypot point of view. But I imagine it was very automated in that they're going to do a port scan, they're going to find the, the, the vulnerability, they're going to jump in, they're going to encrypt your data or take your data as well. There's a lot of in exfiltration threats out there as well at the moment. But um, yeah, that was that was fun. <laughs> Thanks, Michael Antonais. Awesome. Thank you.